Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 57 of Run to the Hills. This week, Gary and I have our usual scintillating chat up. Chat up? Catch up? Is that, I can, that I can set you up if you want, Gary. Ooh, okay. uh, that's the stuff we normally do off air, but we can record if you like. And we catch up with Rick Downs, who's race director of Punk Panther, and we hear all about his story. Um, yeah. It has a dramatic turn of events, um, but it's a great story and how he came to start this race series and his history of running. It's a really great chat. We had to, it was a long chat. We had to, in the end, go, okay, we've got to, we've got to call it because we could have talked to him all day. So it been two shows, really. He was great. He was great. What have you been up to, Gary? What's news in the hood? Oh, in the hood. Um, well, we did the sessions for the week i did pills on tuesday with robo that was you good you got some bigfoot 2300 or something is that what it was oh wow how many, <laughs> how many hills did you have to do to get that oh i don't know but you know what it was a funny session i think um i really didn't fancy it. i was feeling a bit poorly um so we set off and then we bumped into a friend and we started talking for about half an hour or something it felt like and then it was like i really don't fancy it now but we do one hill and then i was struggling um and then we just kept doing, we said, let's do another hill. And then we did it in the end. It wasn't a perfect session, but we both were pretty tired at the end of it. Um, so, yeah, we did it. And then I went to Harry's. I've been to Sedgwick Harry's for a long time. And we did a more reduced session because of cross country at the weekend. So that was nice to have a catch up, see some faces that I've not seen for a while. I, you know, typical older runner, the more, more is better for an older runner. So to do a reduced session, I felt a bit like, oh, I wish I was doing whatever, 10 times a kilometre, but it was probably uh, sensible based on having a cross country on Saturday. And that was, it was pretty, you know, it was pretty emotional being on the start line. There's been a lot of things that happened in people's lives. And the, uh, you know, the organisers mentioned some people who'd been heavily involved in cross country weren't there anymore. So it was quite a poignant moment standing on the start line. Um, but the race went well. I looked back at my old times and it wasn't the disaster that I oh. thought it would be. Yeah, a few more years and on my legs. And I think all of my times at Reckington, maybe probably about a minute between them all, even like say from Saturdays to when I very first did it. And I always treat cross country, I don't race them, but you know this. If you say do uh, say 5k, 10k pace, your 10k pace isn't really that much different to your 5k pace, maybe 10 or 15 seconds a mile. So you're still tired. It's not like I skipped around cross country. I was, you know, high 150s. My heart rate was, was for me, that was that was a good effort, but it wasn't like a race effort. But yes, yeah, fantastic. I was the last scorer, so that was good on our team. So I scored a point <clears throat> and Sedgefield, although we are in the bottom division, it's quite a small club, Sedgefield. Early days, but we're top of the league, Eddie. Top of the top of the league. <laughs> Can't say the same for Tottenham Hotspurs. Oh, I've, yeah, got, got I've got a house of Tottenham Hotspurs fans, and there was uh, <laughs> it was turned off after eighty nine minutes. Well, that's it. That's it. Oh, it's just it. Oh, I can't. I can't watch anymore. He's only eight, and he's like, I can't watch anymore. I cannot watch anymore of it. That's oh, life lessons football. I love that. It's great life lessons. <laughs> and what I'm quite proud about with my little football fan um, is he he'll stick with them. You know. Kids can yeah. be quite fickle, and he's yeah. the, the match of the day posters. They're still up there, and yeah. he's still uh, he's still backing them, and he'll watch the whole match. But he's picked the high bar, hasn't he? You know, it's not like say me supporting Sunderland and Harley Pool, my local team. Um, I had a friend once who, when I was younger, yeah, <laughs> I had a friend once who was saying, "Oh, it's dreadful being a Man United supporter," and I'm like, "You joking me?" He was like, "Champions League, won the league, how many times? You know, seventy thousand people every week. You try supporting, say." Sunderland or Hartlepool where it's more negative than positive but yeah to but ice. The, the, the heart's in there isn't it the heart with those <laughs> you know Tottenham Hotspur yeah it's pretty much all just about he just likes watching Harry Kane a good team Harley Tottenham I don't know they did it but all through uh, I remember as a child they were never my second team but 
there's teams that you dislike, but Tottenham are one of, the, one of those teams that I always do. not to like, is it? Yeah. There's, a, there's a good mix. I like I like the support. I can give them five minutes of my time, and then I, I creep away and go and try and do something else. Anyway, this isn't a football podcast. No, no, it's a different podcast altogether. What about you, Tib? A time, you know, you were struggling a bit during the week, overdid it. I had a bit of a rough week last week. I, um, I did a really good session. I did my progressive, my last progressive, and it was only 4K, and and um, so three by four K, quite flat for me. I think it was only about 800 feet, you know, about a couple of hundred meters of climbing in there. Um, so you get the downhill as well, but it's just the rhythm is hard to get when you're yeah. down and up, down and up and your heart rate goes that bit down and that, but, but that's my racing. So that was fine. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was flying the last, the last few Ks. I was just like, oh, this is, I feel good. I feel yeah. good. And then, um, yeah, then the next day I was destroyed. I don't see Joe that I can do these really hard sessions, but the more I definitely, my net after this race and when I re um, look at my next block of training, I'm definitely going to give myself more recovery. I thought, even now, I, I normally give myself two days. I think now I need three or four days between yeah. a session. Um, and we know from previous conversations that I can push myself really hard. And so I will push myself really hard in the sessions. And and I'm finding, actually, this is terribly dull for everybody else, but for you, Gary, I'm sure you're interested, is bit. that the last month or so, I've been able to put my heart rate up about five beats higher than I have for a very long Ooh. time. I need to look into that and see if that's actually fitness or yeah. sort of learnt. I'm more confident at going yeah. harder. But I have been able to, and I wonder as well if that's because I'm I'm actually at my absolute max in some of these sessions and I do need to respect that. So, yeah, and then I got this yes. terrible migraine and you got the sad WhatsApps going, I can't, I can't, I can't do anything. You got a sick note. <laughs> Sick note, not had one of those for a long time, but totally, I think my own doing, did this hard session. And then Wednesdays, we manic Wednesdays with the kids and I fitted in my sessions. You know, I literally had 40 minutes and I jumped on the bike and then I just yeah. did not respect the rehydration process. Oh. You get that flicker. I don't know anyone that's listening that gets migraines knows and I could feel it coming, but I just carried on. And then, of course, I finished with the kids about half past seven on the Wednesday night and I was like, I've got to do my bike session now. It's all in, Eddie. You can't skip. And sensible Eddie should have gone, no, it's half past seven. You yeah. haven't. You haven't eaten and drunken, drunken, drinking, drunken. I <laughs> hope drunken. <laughs> the verb I am looking for <laughs> properly, you know, actually go and chill, put your feet up and have a nice dinner. But I didn't, I did my session and then that was it. And then I wiped out the next few days. Good, good Eddie, classic Eddie. Um, so that sort of, I, we called time a bit. I did, an, I did another good session on Saturday, but I felt I was asking, I like to do my sessions before a race. I like to feel that it's a bit of icing on the cake. And I felt yeah. that the session on Saturday was a bit of like, I'm having to push quite hard. So <laughs> I, I sent the sad message to coach going oh, i'm done i'm done i want to back off now so we're having yeah and i don't have a problem with doing this and i know lots of people do so try i have no problem with i just take two days off just just yes because i'm i'm a big believer in rest is a miracle so yeah the dogs are like what's happening what is this walking you're doing and why are we here we've got loads of energy so they're driving me mad but yeah race week so i am focused i've got all my stuff the other side of the screen it's all laid out ready for Bryn in this little bag for crew points i'm in bed by nine i'm i'm i've got printed out i've even printed out all the we've got a little road book of instructions and i've put it all in a folder for Bryn so he just has to open oh, it. Look, admin. I've done all the admin because I'm not I'm not having it there's no excuses so if it all goes wrong there's oh, no excuses this is next week <laughs> I've not run 80k it's 80k with 2000 it says 900 meters but last year it said 2600 meters so I'm a bit scared where the extra 300 is <laughs> coming anyway, it's early through the April. um I've not run that far Mm, I don't know when I last did that. A couple of years now. I think I've run like near that, but in training, but not yeah. in a race. So I'm quite looking forward to that. I'm quite looking forward to like that. I love that middle section. It, re- it really hurts. You've done like 50K. You've still got a long way to go. Ooh. It's good, isn't it? The, like, the, um, the unknown, like you say with London, for me, it's, uh, it's it, it shouldn't feel like it's unknown, but it, is, it, it does. I really don't know if I can run 
that far at pace. Let's let should we talk about London at the end? I've got my t shirt on, I've got a London t shirt. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> it's a nice blue, it brings out your eyes. Yeah. Little, little brown eyes, wrinkly eyes. <laughs> right, let's talk results. Yeah, Manchester, the great Manchester thing. I know it's not a Hills, one of the Hills, but Salisha McColgan took the win for the ladies. 32 minutes and 52 seconds. Wowzers. I can't imagine moving my legs that I, fast. I can't imagine moving my legs that I mean, no, not even like 10 meters. <laughs> 45 minutes, like a degree downhill. You couldn't do it. I still couldn't oh. go that fast. No. And Mark Scott took the overall win 28 minutes. That's another two minutes, or oh, maybe three minutes faster. Both of these. Did well at the Great North Run a few weeks ago, so they have had a pretty good couple of weeks. So, yeah, well done. But, yeah, imagine 28 minutes. Oh, my goodness me. When we had the Tunnel Ultra, all my life. Okay, so this is described as 200 miles, 200 times nonstop through the darkness of the UK's yeah. longest foot tunnel. And Mark Cobain, who organises the race, describes it as a mind-bending test of extreme endurance and sensory deprivation. It sounds like having three kids to me. Uh, I I cannot. Anyway, I just can't get my head around. I, I just, I, I, there's no words. Christian Maudot won it in 51 hours, 40 minutes. And Mandy Foster, not far behind in 54 hours, 55 minutes. Oh, you need to talk to one of them, Gary, about how. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about head torch batteries. Whoa. <laughs> How many? Do you think they had the really expensive Petzl? Uh, <laughs> what are they? The really um, the big one that goes on the back of your head. Imagine when, if you like, see it's out, out and back, you can have all the other runners dazzling you in the eyes. Yes. How do what? Now, there's so many questions we could ask about that. I don't like the sound of it. How do you know if it's night or day? I mean, you must get really confused. Do you think you start tripping up? And you pop out the tunnel, don't you? You do see the end of the tunnel at some point. But you have to like turn. have a blindfold on when they bring you out into the daylight and they have to yeah. slowly take it off. And at some point, uh, there's a run that we do in the day and you can go in a tunnel. Um, and you do get tunnel vision when you come out of it. If it's a sunny day, it's very uncomfortable for, like, say, 10 metres until you kind of calibrate again. Imagine you know. how bad you feel after a 100 miler, let alone a 200 miler, let alone having done that in the dark. I wonder if it really messes with you. Yeah, it's messing with me. Just it's, it's just with me just imagining it. Let's move on. I can't bear it. North of Coastal Half Mountain, you mentioned this last week, and um, I really should check this out. I think that'd be wonderful um, moving around the country a bit to do some other races. Georgina Armstrong took the win for the ladies in three hours, 45 minutes and 29 seconds. And Ian Ward took the win for the, the overall win, three hours, 17 and 15 seconds. What we'll say, you know, we do get these results from uh, the internet. So we can't guarantee they're always correct. So if there's any race, race directors want us to... Uh, kind of feature their race, then email us, email us the results because we, we sit rattling all these names off, Eddie, and we might have some of them wrong over this sometime. No one's complained yet, though. <laughs> no one's complained. And if you want your result read out, just message us. Yeah, Save get in touch. Gary hours of planning. Then we had Spartathlon. Now, Gary, I think this race could be up your street. 153 <sighs> miles, all on road, bit of climbing. Get sunshine. Ru there are lo loads of stray dogs around. Yeah, I like a bit. I'll uh, probably bring about five home. <laughs> 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 so we're going back. Oh, now well, here we go. To, one by two Greeks, I think. Zizimopoulos yeah. Sofotis. No, it's not how he says his name, but he won in twenty-one hours fifty-seven. I I watched some footage of his running. So strong, they look like they they look like they're out for the Great North Run. And Diana Zaviza. Zaviza, yeah. Yeah, I reckon that's it. Twenty-five hours, twenty-four minutes. Um, wow. I know lots of Brits that have done this race. It's not on, not particularly, probably too much road for me. But um, it looks great, the whole atmosphere around it and the whole story behind it. Anybody that's ever done it has always raved about it. I think if I was fit enough, it would definitely be like a destination event that I'd like to do. Like, a, you know, these book, we talk about bucket list, bucket list races. That is definitely a classic, yeah. But I think it's quite hard, isn't it? It's not an easy race to cut off. Since no, because you have to go through the first 50 miles. I think it's in nine hours or nine hours 30. So you've got to be ticking along in that yeah. first 50 miles. Um, and, then, and then you've got another 100 miles to go. Uh, there's a lot of checkpoints as well. And I think that quite messes with people because yeah. you're seeing people a lot. And then you've got a big mountain to climb as well. But I think that's probably quite a relief for a bit of a hike for a, a lot of the runners. And the conditions, of course, it's road, it's motorway, it's hot. Though they had a storm a couple of years ago. I remember my yeah. it in the storm. Um, 
yeah i mean it looks it looks amazing maybe one day never say never if they want to reach out to us eddie we could have a little sunny jolly <laughs> oh that'd be awesome yeah <laughs> can we just go for holiday yay <laughs> uzo <laughs> Yeah, this week's interview, we have a chat with Rick Downs, Punk Panther Race Director. Um, super interesting guy and with loads to talk about. I had such a blast actually listening to Rick's um, tale, lots of highs and some lows, but he's still there. And um, I saw some photographs from a recent race that they've done, the Punk Panther Reservoir Dogs, <clears throat> um, which happened on Saturday and it looked like everyone had a fabulous time. And I, yeah, love to chat with Rick. I hope you do too. Today, it's great to be joined by Rick Downs. Rick has gone from top orienteer to Punk Panther ultra marathon race director. In 2016, Rick collapsed from a hereditary heart condition, but thankfully was revived at the scene by passers-by by using uh, a defibrillator and performing CPR. So, gosh, I'm sure there's a story here that we're going to hear all about. Um, welcome to the podcast, Rick. How are you? Where are you? And have you been for a run today? Hi Edwina, um, thanks for having me along. Um, I'm currently in my office, my home office, um, which is at a place called Old Paul Bank uh, near Otley in West Yorkshire. And if I go out my front door and turn right, I'm on a public footpath which leads effectively into uh, Danefield on the Shevin, which gives oh. me uh, uh, a beautiful uh, forest and hill to run up oh and down and see across the valley. Wow, have you been out on it today? No, the reason is I'm going to do something I've never ever done before. I belong to a running club and uh, they have a handicap series and uh, I'm not a fast runner. So handicap sort of quite helps me sometimes. Um, and this evening they have, uh, I think they've hired the running track at Keithley Athletics. And so they've got a 3000 meter challenge handicap. I've never, ever run on a track before. I hate road running with a passion, but you've got to try everything once. So that's why I haven't been out yet today. I'm off out to do a... Uh, Love it. You're having a mini taper. <laughs> mini taper ready for the track. So you don't like road. You don't see so just going straight in track 3,000 metres. So they'll start people at like, have you got to put time in that you think you could do? And then they kind of like... No, they, they know because um, I've been a member of the club for a number of years. So they just base it on my... Um, previous performances no sandbagging no can't do that <laughs> unless of course I've been um, <laughs> um, right. playing it uh, cool for a few years and just decided this tonight's the night no, I gave up on speed some time ago and uh, concentrated more on distance and yeah. so to me the uh, the goal and the achievements are in the distance not not the time yeah and have you invested in some spikes for tonight or are you going <laughs> road shoes <laughs> I was wondering whether I should uh, put on some um, trail shoes with grips on but I thought no <laughs> put the road shoes on uh, like I say I, I'm not interested in time it's just supporting the club and uh, having an evening out yeah I think if you went for spikes your Achilles would not oh. you see even oh. the pros take their spikes off as soon as they finish don't you they're like yeah. oh, this is a pain yeah, well, yeah, I'll tell yeah. you what, I um, I had a problem a few years ago where my Achilles attached itself to my to the back of my ankle and uh, I had to have a, a saline blasted between it to separate it because oh. all the um, all the blood vessels and uh, everything were growing and it had attached itself and it was just blowing it, growing like a balloon That's and uh, it was getting worse and worse and just the <laughs> simple injection detached it and back running again. Oh, wow. I've got off lately, I think, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> I get actually. So I'll get one of those baker's cysts on my back of my knee. No, whatever. You're not going to top Nick, Rick. Don't try. <laughs> oh, I've got a few. I've got a few more besides. Well, that. I know they're going to come in a minute, aren't they? I can hear what I'm going to be like. I'm going to have to go make a cup of tea. Well, I know a bit about your journey. Bits of kind of um, read via email and stuff like that. But, you know, what a story. Could you share with our listeners uh, your history as an athlete, and um, you know, ultimately how you ended up setting up the Punk Panther series? Yeah. How long have you got and where do you want me to start? Go for it. Oh, it yeah, well, hours. <laughs> okay. Well, as um, just as I was moving into my teens, my father, who um, well, 
loved maps, absolutely loved maps. And he became a rally navigator and was once put forward for, I think it was Tony Pond, who was, a, it was, Tony Pond, was one of the top British or English um, rally drivers at the time. And uh, he decided not to take up on that offer. Um, and then he discovered orienteering, which was sort of fairly new to the country. And he progressed up in the ranks and uh, used to organise events and was very high up in the local club. Yeah. And uh, so I got dragged along, if you like, to, to races and really enjoyed them. Um, I found that I was never very fast, but my map reading was absolutely spot on. Yeah. And a friend of mine who's um, raced with top athletes, and I think he could do something like a 50-minute, 10-mile, something like that. Uh, he's really fast. Um, we used to record almost identical times. It's a bit like the heron tortoise. He'd go flying off uh, and uh, round the paths, and I'd navigate the direct route and uh, get there sort of almost at the same time. So that's where my sort of passion for running came from. And then um, one thing led to another, and uh, I ended up, well, I did end up on the committee of the local club at the age of, I think it's 17, 18, and uh, started organizing events for them, yeah. even at that age, um, color coded events. Um, but then I moved away um, and life took over. And for probably, I've written, I've actually written a book that I've not published, which details all of this. <laughs> um, but it was probably something along the lines of 20 plus years um, that I didn't run for. And uh, I'd got to about 18, st nearly 18 stone. Yeah. And uh, I went to a barbecue at the in law's house. And uh, I thought, oh, I've forgotten something. I'll just jog back home. Couldn't even make, make it to the end of the street. And I thought, this is serious. And there was an advert on the telly at the time. And this little kid was drawing draw a picture of his dad um, with a big belly or whatever. And, um, you know, and, and um, I can't remember exactly now, but it was sort of warning you to look after your heart because his dad had a heart attack. So I thought, right, that's not going to be me. And, of course, there's a big irony coming up later in the story, but not attributable to that. So uh, I'd always wanted to do the London Marathon. And every time when I thought about it, it was after it, entries had closed and it was too late. Yeah. And uh, so I said, I'm going to run next year's London Marathon. Mm -hmm. And this was sort of like summertime. And um, so uh, obviously I missed it, but I managed to get a charity place. So, right, let's go for it. So I went out and uh, I went out at night so nobody could see me. <laughs> and I went to run around the local park and I sort of jogged for about 20 yards. Yeah. Walk, walk for a cup, walk for a minute or two, jogged again and yeah. made it round and did about half a mile. Went home. I was so proud of myself that I thought I'll take the next day off. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but then gradually I developed my own little technique where each day I jog a little bit further, walk yeah. a little bit less and increase and increase and increase. And then it got to one point where I didn't need to stop to walk. So I gradually increased my distances and I'd also, um, I adopted a very interesting diet. I called it the no C diet. So no chocolate, no crisps, no Ooh. cake, no cookies. Um, and uh, there's probably a few others in there as well. No no cheese, no no cream. And just took out all the C's and uh, had everything else. Why, why, um, why this story? Uh, Was there a reason, like nutritionally why, or you just, it seemed to make sense to you? Well, you can, there's a thousand and one diets out there. And uh, which one do you pick? Mm, uh, and which, which one could I work with? And I thought, I've got to lose se a serious amount of weight here because I was I think I was 17 stone 10. I thought, I've got to lose a serious amount of weight. And I thought, I'm eating all the wrong foods. So yeah. let's start to eat the right foods. And um, let's not worry about how much I eat, but graze, not have big meals and sort of feast and famine. Let's just have something to eat every hour or so, but not a lot and stuff that's good for me. So yeah. that, that was my own decision. I didn't read it anywhere. I thought I'd give it a go. Anyway, I, I, by the time the summer had finished and uh, a few months later, um, I was down to just under 13 stone. I'd lost a shed load of weight. And when people first saw me that hadn't seen me over the summer, they said, they said are you okay? You know, thinking that I'd, I'd got cancer um, yeah. or some serious illness. And it was actually because I was now at this point running um, sort of four or five times a week and I was up to running um you know 10 miles at a time and things like this and I was really going for it and um so got to the London Marathon and uh I, I'm doing really well 
got uh, halfway round and uh, got cramped. And uh, funnily enough, um, I saw this guy ahead of me um, from memory. I think he was in a kilt. And um, there was a guy talking to him. And uh, as he finished talking to me, he walked up and, took, and shoved a microphone in my face and said, um, do you mind doing an interview? And I thought, yeah, it's probably for a local London radio station. Anyway, so I did this interview and I said, look, I've got cramp. I'm going to get around one way or another. Um, even if I have to walk or drag my leg around, I'm going to get around, yeah. uh, which I did. But uh, about half an hour or so later, my phone started going mental and uh, friend rang up am i on telly am i on telly i said what do you mean well, you're being interviewed on telly and they taken the interview it was actually um itv they'd taken the interview banked it and they what they do is they they review them and choose the ones that they want to broadcast yeah and um so when um paula radcliffe um was receiving a trophy on the on the uh, tv and they cut out from her they sort of faded out and faded me in. So for the first and only time in my life, I was just after Paul Radcliffe in the London Marathon. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, so they broadcast the interview. Um, uh, and, and I dyed my hair pink for the race, and um, I was running as the Punk Panther, as it were, and I got loads of sponsorship. And that was the start of my uh, sponsorship journey. And um, over the years of running, and also with Punk Panther Ultramarathons, um, I've, I've raised probably probably near to near to sixty thousand yeah. pounds um which isn't bad yeah. over the years and uh, so that was my first london marathon um i managed to finish in i think it was about four hours 50 um which considering the second half um was mainly walking with the odd bit of sprinting because i found that when i sprinted it didn't hurt the hurt my um <laughs> cramp but Speed I couldn't sprint for long. <laughs> So I'd sort of be overtaking loads of people and say, did you start late? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I get gets to the end and uh, I walks up to the charity and uh, I'd hardly broken sweat because I'd sort of slowed up towards the end because of the walking. And they said, yeah. have you been around? Are you sure you've been around? I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I got went home and I, I flew. I'd been sponsored by a neighbour who used his business miles to fly me down to the London Marathon. Oh, brilliant. And so uh, I flew back from the London Marathon got back to the airport and um i'd missed the last bus home so i thought i'm not paying for a taxi so i walked home from the airport it's about three miles That's and i've got this massive pack on my back and um i got home and i was absolutely fine and my neighbor saw me the next morning said how did it go so i told him i said to be honest i, I found it a bit easy you know um i was wasn't out of breath and um you know i walked home afterwards and uh, she said well, that wasn't that, that wasn't much for you then. So uh, the following day, following week, he came to me and says, Rick, Rick, I've got it. I've got a challenge for you. They're just reopening Hadrian's Wall Walk. Why don't you do that? So the following year, to celebrate my 40th birthday, um, I decided I'd um, do Hadrian's Wall solo um, in a day. Ooh. Which um, I had a well, I had a support team, and I did it for the African Children's Choir and uh, raised about £3,000 for humanitarian and educational aid to be shipped to uh, uh, the Gabon and um, Uganda. Amazing. And uh, so when I did that, when we got to the pub at um, uh, Bowness on Solway, um, the landlady said, um, have any of you chaps uh, done the wall? And uh, they said, yeah, he has. And uh, they said, so she said to me, what time did you start? I said, oh, midnight. No, no, not what time you, you started today. What time did you start at Wall's End? Said midnight. I'd done it in um, 22 hours. Really? Uh, uh, you know, effectively unsupported, although I'd had this team meet me with um, refreshments. And um, she said, you're joking. No, no, I don't mean today. <laughs> How long is it taking you? I said, two hours. Just give me my beer. <laughs> and, 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 well, exactly. That's what they did. And they um, passed the hat around the pub and announced it in the pub and um, wrote my name in the book. She said, it's the first person I know that's done it in a, in a um, inside the same day. Oh, anyway, yeah. uh, a couple of years later, I saw um, an advert for a race called The Wall. And uh, I thought, oh, I've done that. Oh, it'd be nice to do it in an organised fashion and get a t-shirt for it. <laughs> yeah, get a t-shirt and a medal. So uh, I signed up for it, 
only to find that it went west to east and I'd done it east to west, which is east to west is harder because I had the rain in my face all the way. And the wind, yeah. And the wind. And uh, the route I took was the wall walk, which at one point almost goes through somebody's back garden. And yeah. uh, it goes over steel rig and um, over the tops. And it's it's a tough, tough um, route. Whereas the wall um, was mainly along roads. That's right. Uh, there's a lot of it along roads. So I found it a lot easier. And uh, I did it a couple of years in a row. And I think I did it about 15 hours the second time. Ooh, wow. Uh, and um, I was really pleased with that. And um, then I discovered, because I'd never heard of ultramarathons. I'd just gone and done them to begin with. Then I found this ultramarathon. And then I discovered that uh, there were more near a home around the Cleveland Way. Yeah. So um, I went and did did those. And um, so I was really enjoying life. And then um, I joined the um, uh, Ron Hill Run Every Day Challenge. Okay, yeah. And uh, I changed it for myself to do Run 10K Every Day. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so like uh, over Christmas, uh, we went up to um, Scotland, myself and my wife. And um, on New Year's Eve, I um, we went up Ben Nevis and uh, came back down and I still went and ran 10k after we got back down and then the following day I ran around I think it's Loch, Loch Linney and uh, that was about 19 and a half 20 miles um, on my own with just a little running pack got back home I was up to day 113 went out for a run I was gonna do about 13 miles that day but I was a bit late for what else I was doing so I thought oh no I'll cut it down to 10 and um, the next thing I remember was waking up three days later in hospital nice. and uh, wondering why everybody was looking concerned around my bed. Um, I was in a, I was uh, high. I was on, I was on morphine. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> the world was a wonderful place. Anyway, piecing it all together, I remembered um, the first sort of nine miles of the run. And um, as I was approaching our village, um, what had happened was it was a hereditary undiagnosed condition. And um, over the years, my um, arteries have been narrowing be um, because I, my body can't um, process processed meat. So nice. things like burgers, sausages, bacon, all the stuff that I love. Yeah. I've never had any since. But what happened was all the fatty deposits constricted my arteries. My body had started replumbing itself. So all my little capillaries were taking on the work. So I was still able to run. I was still, I was still fine. I was getting fitter and fitter. Yeah. The week before I'd run my fastest ever um, 10K. And so, um, but then what happened was I had a blood clot. And that little blood clot stopped the major flow into the heart. And so that resulted in a heart attack and a cardiac arrest. Yeah. And um, I was 30 seconds from my front door and my wife was at work. Had I gone through my front door, I wouldn't be here now. Yeah. Had it have happened a few minutes earlier, I was across the fields. I wouldn't have been found. It happened outside a play park opposite a petrol station. And um, a woman saw me fall and thought I tripped. So she came yeah. across, put me in the recovery position. And a second woman on the scene um, who worked, at, she's an accountant that worked at a local business. And for the first time only and ever, she not managed to get the books to balance that lunchtime. So she stopped an hour, half hour late. So she was late coming through and she saw this woman bent over this bloke on the floor and thought, oh, what's going on there? So she pulled up and the, the first woman said, oh, he's tripped. It's OK. I'll put him in the recovery position. So she checked my pulse. She said, he's not breathing. Get him on his back. We need to do CPR. Well, neither of yeah. them knew CPR, but they remembered the uh, BG staying alive. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> pressed up and down on the chest, um, managed to snap four ribs, which... Afterwards, she was really mortified that she'd broken my ribs. And I, so the first thing I did when I met her afterwards is I said, thanks for breaking my ribs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> otherwise. Anyway, um, the next person along was uh, a student at Leeds University who was taking a different route because he was late that day and he wouldn't normally have cycled that way. But he had first aid knowledge, so he knew exactly what to do. Mm. And then there were two workmen who then came in to supply the muscles. So there were four of them taking turns to do the CPR. And they were on a contract nearby and they just popped to the garage for lunch and they should have been back in the northeast of Scotland. They were working, uh, the contract had overrun. Yeah. And then finally, a, um, a skip driver came along who lived, whose parents lived in the village and he was just popping to visit them. And he knew where the defibrillator was. So I went and got the defibrillator and um, they said they put it on the chest and it was like in the film. 
you know, it said stand clear. And my body arched as I flew up in the air as the electric shock went through me. Yeah. The air ambulance came and apparently I'd been 20 minutes at the scene and stopped breathing three times at the scene. And then I stopped breathing three times, uh, sorry, again in the air ambulance on the way to uh, Lee's General Infirmary. Infirmary. So I was lucky to be brought back so many times. Yeah. They said afterwards, because way afterwards when I got back home, uh, half our street had turned into runners because they'd seen what, what I'd done yeah. before. And then they'd all stop running because they said, well, if that's what running does for you, yeah. you know, we don't want to know. And uh, I said, no, they said that the only thing that made me survive, I would have had the heart attack years ago. It's just that being fit had stopped it. But also being fit had meant that they'd been able to bring me back to life. And uh, had I not been as fit, I wouldn't yeah. have survived. And I was so lucky that that second lady had started the CPR because although she hadn't got my heart going to begin with, yeah. she'd managed to force oxygen through my brain. Without that, I would have either been brain dead or had yeah. some um, uh, ill effect. I mean, the fact that I'd gone on to do running might mean that I have. But <laughs> um, the, the nice thing also about my, my surgeon, uh, the consultant that did the operation, he uh, said to me as I was laid there, he said, right, you've got two choices. One is you go home now, you've got a 40% chance of having another heart attack, which you will die from. Or the other is um, I can do a triple bypass on you and um, you'll be good to go, good as new. Um, but I'm only going to do it on one condition. He said, um, you to get back to ultra running and you're not to uh, sit at home watching Jeremy Kyle all day. I'm not wasting my time on you if that's yeah. what you're going to <laughs> and my wife said, and she said, how can you possibly be thinking of running? And I'm saying, let me add it. Let me add it. So yeah. uh, 48 hours after the operation, uh, I was back home. Um, seven weeks later, I did the Leeds Half Marathon with a defibrillator on my back, raised money to buy four more. Yeah. And um, six months later, I think it was, I was doing a 60-mile ultramarathon. <laughs> so, and I've not looked back since. I see where we live as defibrillators. Just for our listeners, they quite self-contained. You just kind of let them do their thing. You know, it's not like yes. people are kind of scared to jump in and help somebody. The defibrillator will do it for you. As I absolutely would be myself, I would have been, I'm, I'm scared to think, would I have actually used a defibrillator myself? Yeah. But having seen them, having learned more about them, the worst case scenario is if you don't know what you're doing, well, there's, you pick it up off the wall, you, well, you don't nine 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 to get the code. Yeah. Pick it up off the wall, open it up, and most of the modern ones now speaks to you, and it will say something like "Stay calm." Yeah. Remove the defibrillator. Yeah. Um, expose the patient's chest. Um, shave the patient's chest where you're going to put the, you know, and it just talks you through it all, and then it doesn't. It says, "Now stand clear so that we can assess the patient," because if you're touching the patient, it can pick up on your heart rate through yes. the patient. So it then listens to the patient's. Um, current situation and decides whether or not shock is appropriate yeah. and then it will say preparing to shock stand clear now the modern ones they'll do it themselves yeah. on the old ones it will say press the button when you are clear press the button so there's the two options yeah uh, but uh, yeah they're very very easy to use you don't need to know what you're doing don't be scared and the other thing i would just say is if you are giving cpr you've got to give it hard you've got to break ribs and if you don't break ribs you're not doing it right and you won't save the person yeah. and there's not been a single case in the uk of anyone ever breaking somebody's ribs and being um sued or prosecuted for yeah. it because you're acting in the best interest of the patient yeah. as you see it um you you do what you think is best and nobody will nobody will uh, challenge you for that remember the Bee Gees. i've heard that a few times stay alive absolutely it, it, i think it's really important as people out on the trails and out and outdoor that we take it upon ourselves to regularly update our first aid knowledge to me yeah. it's something i do every two or three years i do my first aid certificate just to and it's always this, it's you know and just to remind yourself just so that it's fresh because more often than not you know you always hear it's dog walkers it's runners that mm. we're with a group and to just have that little bit of confidence like mm. those people did with you just to step in and and help in it you never hope you never have to use it but um if you do to have that um, so, Rick, yeah. moving on, how has your life changed from now? You talked about seven months later, you're back running. Um, yeah. 
what 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 changes have you had to make maybe like no. you talked about the diet has life been oh, sort of back to normal or and what yeah. when this was 2016 so this is five years ago now four five years yeah. ago so um actually also to answer to answer that and to answer one of your earlier questions as well so um at the time i was actually at university retraining to become a primary teacher and um i won't go through what happened afterwards but for one reason or another um we decided that i was going to abandon that that option and uh, so they've said to me um well what do you want to do with your life you know what, what do you want to do what would you really like to do and i said well I was thinking we've got some lovely trails around us, but there are no ultramarathons actually in West Yorkshire in and around Leeds that I'm aware of. And uh, I kind of like to organise one just to see if we can get a few people along to have a bit of fun. And uh, I said, actually, I know of two potential routes that exist. I could do it. And she said, well, don't stop at two. Um, you've got to do a race series of six. And uh, so I said, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. So um, a good friend of um, mine, uh, well, friends john and shirley Steele, who you're probably oh, aware of who did the hard nurse i rang them up and said um can i come and have a chat um i'm looking at organizing some races and uh they were you know um i'd met them through hard Moors. that was a 60 mile race that i'd done um prior to my heart attack and um yeah sure come and have a chat so they basically held my hand and talked me through how they organised their races, which was very, very kind of them. Because they're over on the Cleveland Way and I'm over in West Yorkshire, although we've got many runners that do both, we're in different areas. And wherever possible, we've tried to avoid the same dates yes. so that we don't have big events on the same day. So they're complementary. Yeah. And um, say that they, they were some of, you know, a couple of our biggest fans and supporters. And so with their sort of, initial guidance shall we say i then went up went away and set up punk panther ultra marathons and uh, the name basically comes from when i first started out on the internet when um years and years ago i was on a chat forum and everybody has pseudonyms and uh, <laughs> i i used to be a punk still like punk music and um when I was a kid, the Pink Panther was my favourite cartoon, so I combined the two together and called myself the Punk Panther. <laughs> and the name just stuck. And actually, I I um, bought the website when the internet first started. And so, uh, when we were looking for a name for the uh, for the um, running business, um, you know, we sat there thinking, what could we choose? Hardmores is such a great name, you know, mm. all the things, and nothing worked. And then I sort of just jokingly said to Bev, well could call ourselves what i used to be called on the internet punk panther i still got the website she says what that's it that's cool you know it's it's out there it's uh, uh, so uh, and that's how it all started now you're saying about changes yes i've changed my diet um i basically um i'm what's i'm not a strict anything but i'm effectively a pescatarian so I eat lots of fish, lots of oily fish, because that's really good for you. Lots of salmon and, and um, mackerel and tuna and things like that. I love fish. Um, if I were to come to your house and you were to um, and I'd make me a chili, uh, cook me a chili con carne, I wouldn't say, no, I don't eat meat. If it's a one-off, I'll eat it. Yeah. Um, but um, if I go out for a meal, I'll nearly always either eat the fish dish or vegetarian or even vegan. There's some lovely vegan food out there and uh, so i will happily eat those and uh, like I, you know so i avoid meat but purely for my own health yeah. reason is the uh, sea diet still in place or are you allowed the oh no, oh no, no. <laughs> although having said that um it tends to be apart from perhaps um on race day and after race day oh that was another one no coke oh by coke i mean I'm sure i could run an ultra without a coke however kit. i must have it on an ultra and that's okay. i love i love the uh there's always a caveat <laughs> the caveat yeah 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 so because i because of because if you're burning sort of ten thousand plus calories a day you've got to replace that you need that energy yeah. and but it's also important from a runner's perspective to find out what energy you need because we all need different things it's all very well saying you know gels or whatever um but if they don't work for you it's pointless to try. One of the best things for me, um, deep into an ultra, is things like cheese pastas. 
Oh. I love chocolate. They, they really hit the mark with And chocolate milkshake, absolutely perfect for me. Yeah. You know, especially on a hot day, I'm craving chocolate milkshake. So, you know, it's what what your body needs. Your body quite often tells you. Some days it'll say, I need some chocolate. I need some chocolate. Yeah. And then another day, um, I need, you know, peanuts or something like that. So. I dream like that. The, the, tu- the tune in the tune in diet. I follow that. What I feel like, what my body says it wants. I like these. the teas. I can knock out cabbage and uh, cauliflower. It'd be great. Or... <laughs> and carrots. I've got, got it wrong. Yeah, carrots. Yeah. <laughs> Chutney. Yeah, there is a slight um, failing in that, but the, the the whole point was, I I, I just. I'm a quirky sort of guy. I'm, I like to be a bit unique. And I thought, yeah. what can I do? And it worked. So yeah, I'm, sure. I'm not necessarily saying it worked for other people, but it worked for me. And I think that's the most important thing in life, to find out what works for you. Yeah. Is there anything changed? Uh, when you were explaining your story, when you collapsed, you know, there's an amazing turn of events by everybody involved for everyone to come together at that time, which helped ultimately save your life. Is there anything that you would do or maybe say to other runners that maybe you should do this, carry an ID band, maybe run with a mobile phone, not only to help themselves maybe, but if they came across somebody who was struggling, any any tips for other runners? No, that's a good one, though. Um, the irony was that when I fell, um, I'd gone blue in the face um, through lack of um, um, oxygenated blood. And um, I'd been there for some time, and somebody f- found that I'd actually got my mobile phone on me. Yeah. And in my mobile phone, it had got my bank card, um, which identified who I was, and it also got my driving license. And one of the people there that had then come to the scene, because it was in my village, said, oh, my God, that's Rick. Yeah. And so, that's not Rick. And the people there actually didn't recognize me. Yeah. Um, but they did manage to identify me. Now, the one benefit of that was then they were able to um, get hold of Bev and let her know mm-hmm. what had happened. And, of course, the... the the problem for Bev was she was in a meeting. They went into her to tell her that I was in intensive care. And uh, she I forget whether she was in a meeting or, not, or somebody got a phone for or something. But then something along the lines of um, they basically said, your husband's in hospital and then he's had a heart attack. And she said, no, you've got the wrong person. And sort of shut the door, put the phone down on them. And then they said, you've got the wrong person. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but no, going back to the original thing, I always carry ID. Yeah. Um, I think, I think it, it, it makes sense to, um, you should always carry, uh, I always carry a phone. Yeah. Always. I've always got my uh, watch on with the room. Yeah. Um, I, if I'm going any distance, I've also got a battery charger on me. You know, if I'm running with a pack, I've always got just a small, um, one of those. Oh yeah. Yeah. USB. Yeah, one of those. Yeah. They don't, don't weigh much and you can just charge your phone up, charge your watch up you know, carry the leads because yeah. you never know when it, when you're going to get stuck, especially in cold weather. Sometimes the cold weather can just knock your battery out. Yeah. Mm. And, um, Good point, yeah. also carry a bivy bag. Always, always carry a bivy bag. Yeah. Um, you never know if you break a leg, you've got to be able to jump into it. Um, so yeah, keep ID on you because at the very least, and if you've got any special medical requirements, then, you know, like, a you can get blood those. group strange blood group or something yeah, yeah. So, I, I always get i always carry a bivy bag now especially now i live in the mountains not only for myself but i'm also like if i ever came across anybody uh, or one of my mates hurt themselves keeping somebody warm when mm-hmm. they've hurt i think that's the biggest thing isn't it that people go down with hypothermia quicker than they um yeah. than they think the- injuries especially if you're doing sport and then you suddenly have to stop <clears throat> I mean, even on a, a normal temperature day, yeah, you you can um, get hypothermia very quickly. Mm. I've um, had early signs of hypothermia several times on um, races. I was sweeping the uh, Hardmore's Fifty Five last year, year before, and uh, there were a few people at the back who were going at just under one mile an hour yeah. in a in a forty mile an hour <laughs> wind and driving rain over the it three was a week to hear that way <clears throat> yeah and i was right at the back and i was i was actually I, I got the aggies i was shaking uncontrollably fortunately we managed to get to a checkpoint where they got a um, biodiesel generator there so i took all my wet clothes off and um put them over that for a quarter of an hour warmed them through and i was yeah. good to go then but had i not been able to do that i would you know 
And also, and um, we may come on to it in a bit, but I've, um, I've done the spine. And uh, on that, I was at Greg's hut and I jumped in my bivy bag and uh, got out and started with hypothermia. And so I decided to jump straight back in and then um, warm myself through and then jump straight out, get everything ready while I'm in the bag, yeah. and then get out and then run. Even though I was knackered, I just thought, if I run, it'll get my core body temperature up. And I thawed myself out on the way down. Yeah. The, the thing to do is, if you, you can move, move. Do not stay, in my view, as long as you're capable of moving. Yeah. Move move down, move in one direction. Get off of where you are. Get down below the cloud base, because I was up in the clouds. And, you know, get to safety. Because uh, you haven't been just a, just a couple of hundred feet, you just get off the top and um, the temperature raises. Uh, yeah, but by loads of curious, is there uh, any specific bivy bag you have? I know there's thermal ones or just those kind of tin foily uh, sleeping bag style. The, the one I've always used in the past, which has never caused me any problems, is the the uh, little sole bivy bag. However, yeah, I've heard that's what I have that, too. Yeah, I've heard one or two bad reports, but I've never had a problem. I used it for the whole spine and I actually managed to just shove it into the pocket yeah. of uh, a running pack and pull it out and it lasted the whole week um i've got a i've got another one now um which is like a gore-tex one it's a little bit more substantial um but i carry both um but uh yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't uh go with just the foil sheets or anything they're, they're almost as uh good as they're for the end of london marathon yeah they're, they're, they're just <laughs> jumping over some shoulders to say well done just keep a bit of body warmth in while you you know no oh, when, when you're up like like behind me high cup nick um i've been up at high cup nick in an absolute whiteout you know and uh you don't want to if you need to crash up there yeah uh, you do not want to just put a little thin sheet of foil over it ain't doing <laughs> ain't, ain't working take it seriously that's you know it may seem a bind to carry kit um but it will save your life um, oh my goodness, mate. No messing about. We've seen 2021, there's a tragedy over in China. So we all know about um, appropriate kit. And, uh, you know, if the race directors are asking for it, there's a reason There's a reason for it. So, yeah, don't. Um, I've heard some pretty, uh, not so good stories about runners dropping their kit off um, with friends or family and then doing the race. And that's, yeah, disrespecting and not taking the conditions. Well, yeah, I have actually had to disqualify a runner out on the course when they discovered they didn't have the kit on them. Oh. So I'm not yeah, messing it's, with it. it's no, You're no messing. Let's no. talk a little bit now about Punk Panther HQ. Yeah. What what that looks like now. So you said you started off, well, you wanted one race and your wife wanted six. Um, <laughs> what does Punk Panther look like now? How is the year? Do we talk about last year? Shall we gloss over that? Um, no, no. You're back on the that. back on the straight and narrow. How has the last year or so been, and uh, how's it looking? F what's it looking like in the future? Okay, so um, we went from running six races in our first year to seven in our second because um, one of the races um, there was a massive downfall of snow the week before. I was taping it in a forty mile an hour blizzard, <gasps> and uh, all the other um, outdoor events in the north of England were cancelled. Um, I basically said to everybody, look. We're still here for you. Um, all of our checkpoints have got four-wheel drives. Uh, if you're mad enough to come out and run, we're mad enough to uh, look after you. Um, there was one um, more that they had to go over, and we said, if you don't want to go over that, that you can go around the road. And four people chose to uh, uh, take the sort of less adventurous route. And um, so what we did was those that couldn't make that race, we put on a second race later in the year when the weather was better for those that couldn't make it. So yeah. we ran seven that year. Um, we always run races, whatever, um, unless we really can't. So when we were increasing the races year on year and putting more into them, we've gone away from, we, we still do the um, the six race series, but we also do one or two other races now. So we do the Dales Way, which yeah. is the full the Dales Way. We do it from west to east, from uh, Windermere to Ilkley. And uh, I'm actually uh, on the committee of the Dales Way Association. So um, I've got there. um backing to do it um we also do the dales highway which is an incredibly challenging and awesome route um from salt air to appleby and westmoreland and uh i know the friends of the dales highway so i know the people that created the 
Dale's Way was created by a chap called Colin Speakman, who uh, is a friend of mine who is um, still doing it to this day, which is brilliant because it's over 50 years old. And the Dales Highway uh, is Chris and Tony Grogan, other and other friend, friends of mine. And when I approached them to say I'd like to do a race, they said, that's brilliant. So they've helped promote it. And uh, this year when we did it, sorry, yeah, it was this year when we did it. Um, I also, because it's 90 miles, several runners said, but we, you've got to make it 100 miles. <laughs> so what I did, and that's the reason for the picture behind, is I extended it from Appleby and Westmoreland to go up to High Cup Nick and back. And that's they right. said, you cruel, sadistic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, we're being broadcast, aren't we? I won't say that. Um, but it's a 13 to 14 mile loop, which involves about two and a half thousand foot of climb. Very nice. Uh, and that's after 90 miles. Yeah. It's an epic, awesome race. And so we've got that. We've also got the Nidderdale Way, because I couldn't run the Dales Way last year because I wasn't allowed in the in the lakes. So we switched it and did it on the Nidderdale Way, which is a... Yeah beautiful route as well and so from that um that's become that's become a very popular race um we've got people signing up for that now and um there's a few others that we're taking on board as well so there's one on the river air which starts from near leeds train station and goes out to malam Tarn. it's it's great because you leave uh, the urban city center in the morning and by the afternoon uh, the evening you're at when you crest the rise up out of malam up to the up to the tarn um you you don't actually go up the cove on this one you go to the side and you, you sort of suddenly get your first sight of malam tarn oh my god i've entered a different world it really yeah. is funny and so these are some of the races that that we offer um how did last year affect us well apart from when the government said you cannot run races you've got to stay at home obviously yeah. we had to cancel but what we tried to do for our runners then last year was to say look um we will defer your entry um with one of them we'd already bought all the t-shirts and medals so what we said to them was we're going to put it we're going to redo it on this date yeah uh, so please come along to this date and because there weren't many other races on virtually the majority of them were able to make it to that date but we also put a second event on just to mop up on a few anyway um we still managed to run eight events last year um one way or another um yeah. With varying numbers of people, we put some very um, good COVID measures in place. Um, we were just doing bottled water, um, bags of crisps, bars of chocolate, so yeah. that before we'd sort of like have a, um, a bowl of jelly babies and a bowl of peanuts, we can't do that in COVID. Yeah. And so um, it was amazing because public that we saw were really pleased to see us out there. They were saying, you know, well done for getting things going again. We had a staggered start, so we had um, people starting every two minutes. So yeah. there was no uh, mass start. And we just looked at everything and made sure that everything was COVID compliant. When we came to the second lockdown, I was very tempted to continue. I didn't, but I was very tempted to continue because it said that elite sport only could continue. So yeah. I looked up in the dictionary what elite means. And elite means something that only very few people can do. And if you think about an ultra marathon of, say, 60 miles, yeah. Only very few people in the country can do it. So by de dictionary definition, it's an elite sport. Yeah. However, um, when I put feelings out, because quite a lot of my runners that work for the NHS, they said, Rick, really, you shouldn't be doing this because the hospitals are full. Mm -hmm. Taking that on board, that was the reason why we stopped mm -hmm. the hospital. Yeah. If somebody had been injured, um, we don't want to put any burden on the NHS. So that's why we did stop. Um, I would have been prepared to have argued my point, but I've also discovered that I, I would have lost the support of many of my runners and it, I probably would have lost that support permanently which is yeah. absolutely the right thing to do but it's always right to challenge and to take everything into consideration yeah. and that's how we were able to get going but we also decided the, the right times to stop and the right times to start up now this year has been a bit more challenging in a way because so many races were delayed from last year so the people that would have entered our races this year had got deferral places mm. from last year yeah. that were then weekends that they weren't the year before. So all of a sudden, we put on a, a brand new race, having run that race last year, yeah. and people had booked for another race, let's say, in November, and that November race was now being run in May, yeah. uh, at the same time as our race. So they're saying, oh, Rick, we'd love to do your race, but we've actually got one that's been transferred from last it's year. It's been deferred entries from last year. <laughs> so that meant that it's um, mm. it, it's affected our numbers this year. So we've 
we've struggled this year, yeah. um, numbers wise. Um, financially, I'm not bothered. I do it for fun. Yeah. However, moving forward, and um, I've taken on board a, a friend, uh, Mark Lyman, who um, has come on board to, be, uh, to basically uh, move us up to the next league, if you like, uh, to add a bit more in and to. We're going to start advertising. We've got a new website coming um, within the week. Um, and so we're going to notch it all up a gear. Whereas I was sort of doing it out the back of the car, yeah. um, the season runners, just enjoying it, <laughs> you know, moving up a bit. So like next month, um, we've got a race on the uh, Nidderdale Way race where we are actually hired the uh, Nidderdale Showground uh, for the start and finish. So, yes. And it'll also be um, a checkpoint halfway for those that are doing the full loop. Um, I like to offer lots of variety. So like for that race, we're, we're allowing people to do a half loop, which is 28 miles, a full yep. loop of 55. And then if they want to go around again, they can do a loop and a half or two loops. So we can actually get people doing about 100, about 110, 112 miles or something like that. And can people and stand at the end of the race? Is it still open for entries? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, get your name down, course. Gary. Peanut. Yeah, go for Pretty it. Babies, crisps. <laughs> no, we've also, not... <laughs> we've also got a race um, in October earlier, which is called Panther Takes a Hindmost, which I devised a few years ago. Before I think before Backyard Ultra. I don't know how long that's been going, but it's a similar sort of idea. But what happens is you run four laps of a circuit. Well, the circuit. Um, was around a couple of reservoirs, but there's some works being done. So it's along the canal at the moment. So you run up and down the canal and uh, you can take your time over your first four laps. When you hit 24 miles, because they're 10 K laps, um, you, on the next one out, the person that finishes it last is eliminated. Yeah. And that every lap. So the last one to finish that lap, is then removed from the race until you've got three left and then they can keep going for as long as they want. I wonder if people would like, I've, I've seen the similar thing, this thing Diamond League try to do with say 1500 metres and what would happen was people would literally jog for three laps and then there'd be like this 200 metre smackdown at the end and somebody would get dropped off the end and then that would be it, they'd be out of the heat, it'd be quite amazing. Well, Fans out. Actually, there's a sting in the tail here because when we did it loops around the reservoirs, there's two reservoirs. So what you could do is you could just do one reservoir and decide to quit. So, but because you'd quit, you have retired, let's say having done five and a half laps. So you've yeah. qualified, done an ultra, whatever. The, pe the person that's ahead of you won't know that they're now the last person. Yeah. The <gasps> so they'll think there's still somebody behind them because they've overtaken them. Yeah. But that person's retired. So unless you can actually see somebody behind you, yeah. you don't know where you are. <laughs> and also like with the out and back one, when you go out and back, it's similar because there's a halfway turning round point. You can turn around at any point you like. So if you've started a lap and you're halfway out on the lap or quarter out on the lap, you think, do you know what? I'm not going to be able to do this one. Yeah. I'll get back and I've got that position. Then the person, when they're coming back, suddenly thinks, but there was somebody else behind me and I've not crossed them oh. coming back. Oh, my God, I've got to catch up the person in front. Oh, so my goodness. Sounds like hell. Try my nice brain this one. <laughs> <laughs> So, who comes up with the names? You got to, you know the the, the reservoir um, dogs and yeah, how, who comes up with the names? Well, uh, funnily enough, we're actually changing a lot of the names for next year, so they're all going to be released in the next week or so. Um, they were all, most of them were based on film titles and uh, film titles with a nod to the location. So reservoir dogs is around the reservoir. Yeah, high life was going to the highest points around where I live. So you go up to the top of Beamsley Beacon, up to the top of the Chevin, up to the top of Wilkley Moor. Um, the Welcome Ultra is based on the Welcome Way. A bridge too far is because um, you go to paint your bridge and turn round. But the original concept of the course was that it's on the Six Dales Trail, which goes to Midland. And I'd originally offered it to Midland and back. And in the first year, I only had one person take up on that. But there are a couple more bridges. So it was a question of which bridge can you get to? So that was the idea behind that one um and so that's how they sort of oh and the urban legend was um because um it starts in Otley, goes almost to the center of leeds and back out but it goes uh, through uh, a lot of the p local parks and the um ginnels and it comes back on the meanwood valley trail so it's about 90 percent off-road yeah uh, but 
it, it would appear that the titles put quite a few people off when they see urban legend. They think that they're going to be running along roads the whole time. Yeah. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> so uh, um, I've, I've also got a reputation that uh, if you're on one of my courses and you're not quite sure which way to go, one of the options is up. Go up. <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> I feel the, the, the actual elevation of some of my races, given the area, is quite surprising. Yeah, uh, you know, people well, it sounds up. like you choose your route. You don't just plan like a route. Your routes, you're really thinking about like the adventure and taking people to, you know, the experience of the route. It's not just like right thirty miles out and back. Here we go to click off the numbers. In fact, that's sort of you not you d the distance is whatever it will be a random yeah. distance. It's much more about the journey and the path and the definitely. The so adventure. quite often. I mean, I know the area very well, and I think, right, I want them to go up to the top of Beamsley Beacon, and I want them to come back um, through Timberlands, and, you know, I want them to have a variety. So but most of all the courses I design, you know, I mean, there's one of the courses where you've got, you go around an airport runway, not actually the runway itself, but outside the runway, there's a fence, yeah. and that is a little pig of a path. Um <laughs> But it's actually quite claustrophobic because you've got an eight foot high security fence that side and an eight foot high security fence that side. And you've got about five foot wide track. And in the winter, it's boggy. Oh. And it's an absolute nightmare. There's one bit where um, if it's been raining, you've got to go through between ankle, ankle and knee deep in water. And there's no way around because there's a fence both sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, But then coupled with that, you go around a tarn, which is beautiful. And then you'll go down an old railway line. Yeah. Then you'll go past um, the original wall pack in for Emmerdale, and yeah. then you'll go through some woods, and then you go through a golf course, and then you'll go up to the top of Bailden Moor. And, you know, I try to combine all features, you know, running along rivers, running along reservoirs. I try and get a bit of everything into the races so that you've got some stunning scenery. Sounds awesome. Sounds amazing. How can our community uh, connect with you? You've got the Punk Panther website. Is that a .com or .co.uk? .co.uk. Punk Panther, all one word, .co.uk. And you've got Facebook groups. Um, do you have a yes. Strava group, a Punk Panther Strava group? Or? There is a Strava group. Um, I must confess, although I'm on Strava and um, I, everything I do gets posted on Strava, I'm not very good at Strava groups. I don't find them very friendly to deal with <laughs> i'm also on twitter uh punk plant the um okay um, but i'm not a big twitter person i find it's very sort of transient you put something on and you know if you if i put something on twitter now um unless you go back through your notifications you sort of won't see it and if you don't go on twitter for a couple of days that's lost facebook is a bit different i'm not a big fan of facebook but it does sort of work yeah um it, much as if you put a post on Facebook, it's going to stay there and it's going to stay relatively accessible. Um, Twitter tends not to be like that for me. Don't I like time, it all. Don't have time for all that twittering. Well, this is it. Yeah, I like it all. But too much twittering time. in my own life. Don't need to put it on a computer. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's that's all my questions. Eddie, you got any more? No. Let's go. Let's go. The bit. Have we got six? One, two. Oh, no. oh, I've got one question actually. Sorry. Um, with your events, um, this bit all kind of out of um sync, but would the events typically be taped or relying on a like navigation to get around? Right. The ones that are on um uh trails, um long distance walks, etc., things like the Dales Way, the Dales Highway, and there are booklets for them. Um and also the River Air footpath and the Nidderdale Way. No, they're not marked they're not. because they are recognised routes. Yeah. Um, and also, quite often with some of those, they ask us not to mark them because yeah. not the idea. The idea of those is partial navigation. Yeah. On our trail series, um, we are currently taping all the – we're taping the short ultramarathon distance as the introductory distance. If yeah. there are longer distances, the loops don't get – taped they used to but at the moment we're not taping them because we think if you want to do an ultra marathon um, and you're new to it and you're not sure then come and do either one of our 13 20 or 28 to 32 milers yeah we'll take you we'll take you around those we'll hold your hand yeah on our on all of our races that are ultra marathon distance involved we supply trackers for all runners 
So we're watching you as well. And if you're lost, you can ring me and I'll uh, tell you where you are. And laugh. Laugh. You'll have people on Facebook. <laughs> Where's number 42 yeah. going? <laughs> how, how did you get there then? <laughs> um, but um, so on the longer courses, therefore, if you're going to be running sort of 50, 60 plus miles, um, you're going to be a more serious runner. You should have done some uh, some shorter ones. And at that point, we think that you probably should have some sort of navigation device, be it um, being able to use your phone or uh, having having a uh, GPS watch, because we we supply GPS files for every single distance of every single course. They're all on the website, so um, we'll help you out if you're a beginner. But once you get to the sort of more serious stuff, you've got to be looking after yourself then. Yeah. Last one from me, though. I like that. With the uh, race series. One thing I would perhaps, another little story that I would like to just put in, if I may. Um, and that was um, this year's spine. Um, I was on top of, um, of uh, Kinder Scout yep. within the five miles or so. And I slipped on a rock and tore two ligaments in my ankle mm. foot. And uh, by the time I got down to the next road crossing, um, my, the side of my running shoe was rubbing badly against my ankle uh, there was no first aid there so I took my sh shoe off and had a look and it was swollen badly so I got so this is the survivalist in me and the determination and I paid that money I'll bloody well do it <laughs> so I get out some KT tape bound, bound it tightly with KT tape and uh, asked if a medic could see me at the next road crossing well because of other events they couldn't um, got to the M62 crossing and I'm still struggling along. Oh, sorry, just before that, I'm on uh, Bleak Low. And on Bleak Low, um, it starts raining and it gets, it's getting quite cold. So it's right. Get me a uh, waterproof out, tape seams and everything. And, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, and uh, so I put that on, goes to zip it up, zip's broken. Oh, my goodness. Couldn't get the zip up. And there's me with this headwind. So only one thing to do, reverse the jacket. Oh. and um, hold it on that way because I'm going into a headwind. Yeah, so yeah. I get gets to the M62 relatively unscathed, um, but I'm thinking I'm just about to go over um, uh, Saddleworth Moor. There's no way at three o'clock in the morning I'm going over Saddleworth Moor without a coat because the conditions were poor. Bless, bless her, the lady in the um, chuck wagon there in the burger van, uh, after I'd had my halloumi burger, <laughs> um, she... Uh, let me have her coat. Well, I insisted on buying it from her. So there's me at three o'clock in the morning walking over Saddleworth Moor in a lady's coat. <laughs> it was perfect, though, because whilst it didn't have tape seams, it was furry lined and I was absolutely toasty warm. And uh, that got me to all the way to Hebden, uh, where I got my um, spare jacket. So I, I did still have the proper kit on me. I did still have a tape seam jacket. It just wouldn't zip up. A fancy so, uh, jacket, an extra. <laughs> I'm surprised you never got on the news again with that one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's the um, Hebden. They looked, the medics looked in the foot and they said, you need to get that x-rayed. Um, I said, just tape it up. So they did. And I got all the way, I got to Malham Tarn and they said, should we have another look at it? And I said, you know, it stopped hurting. I can't believe it. Yeah. So I'm climbing, goes up, leaves there. And just as I'm going away from there, uh, on a different part of the foot, absolute agony. So I managed to get up Fountains Fell. Coming down the other side, um, I'm going to give it a go. Going up Penny Ghent, and I'm so, by this point, I'm dragging the leg up Peggy, Penny Ghent. And coming down, those new steps coming down are awful. Going down towards um, uh, Horton, absolutely awful. And... Uh, I'm having to go down sideways because I uh, mentioned earlier I've got no cartilage on my knee, so forwards down big steps is painful, so I go down sideways. And then the rocky ground, that's it. It's buggered me. I'm doing one mile an hour, and uh, my foot won't elevate. I've lost the elevation in my foot. All my toes had gone completely numb, and I couldn't wiggle them at all. Mm. And uh, at that point, the safety team were at uh, Horton. I said, you're going to have to give me a lift to hard draw. I can't go any further so i'd actually done 91 miles on torn ligaments so that's just how mental i am <laughs> and uh, people looked at it afterwards and all the bruises they said how on earth could you even walk on that let alone do 90 odd miles amazing isn't it because i love it absolutely love it will um, you will you go back yeah i'm the first, uh, i was one of the first to sign up for next year's 
Hey. Hey. I'm, on, I'm already on the start roster. Don't worry. I love it. I love it. Um, right, but, Rick, thank you. So we've, you've, you've, um, gosh, you've filled our podcast. So I could talk to you all day, but. Awesome. <laughs> Um, but I do want to pop in these. These are Go quick on. five. There are quick five questions. We'll try Go and on. there's a couple that might not be quick, but let's do them. Uh, early bird or night owl? Both. Oh my 24/7. god! Just all day, all night. Twenty four seven. Never time. Uh, starter or pudding? Starter. Ooh. Pet peeve. Biggest pet peeve as a race director. <laughs> um, you can be PC I, about this. You've got a business. No, no that, that's got to be people cancelling within the last two weeks and asking for a refund. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Don't do it. <laughs> Bucket list race. Bucket list race. I've, I've done them. Um, Bucket list race. <laughs> I mean, the next challenge I've set myself, that's not a race. That's all right. Big yeah. challenge. That'll do. Big challenge. Well, last year I did the Yorkshire Three Peaks three times in a row. I'm wanting to do them four times in a row. Um, not if I find time, I'll do them next month. Oh, sweet. What yes, you sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. And then yeah. I'll keep one a year until I can't do them. <laughs> Oh, wow. There was a man that did that. He added a mile to it. He started when he was 30 and he added a mile to his run that he did on his birthday every year. And he's now like 76. He's still wow. going. Actually, that is one of my challenges to make sure that each year I run more miles in one go than my age. Well, that's a good one, isn't it? I like that. There's no stopping you. Scone or scone? I don't eat them. What? <laughs> well more for us thing. Gary yeah. <laughs> I'll have a scone um, okay um, I, I'd, I'd have to say scone Ooh. oh I see Rick that's very good <laughs> Got you. Uh, and final question what would be your running track your running tune of choice to add to our Spotify playlist well apart from the fact I mentioned in shreds by the comedians earlier I think we will go with that okay we're putting it on there. It'll be dedicated to you. Knowledge, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna check that out. A bit of knowledge. Yeah, there you go. It's, Rick, uh, good luck with everything, great. with your race directing, with your adventures, all that you do. You're gosh, what an inspiration. I feel I oh, whine on about this podcast about how busy I am <laughs> and so much. And I'm, I'm not Rick, am I? <laughs> <laughs> and good luck for the weekend. Part of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too sure when we'll air this show, so I'm wishing you good luck um, after the event has happened. But yeah, all the best um, for this. Yeah, event. No. yeah. well, we've, we've, one thing to just say is that we uh, do an event every month. So if you check out uh -huh. the website, we've always got we've always got an event. We we go from 30, next year we'll be going from 13 miles up to 113 miles. So there's plenty there for everybody that enjoys any level that. of uh, trail running. And we're there to help you around. Awesome. Brilliant. Well, thanks for coming on, Rick. Take okay. care. Thanks. You're very welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Rick, and good luck with all your future endeavours with both your running and with the Punk Panther Race Series. Upcoming races. Big local one, Kill the Marathon. Mm. Lots, of, lots of friends doing that. So it's quite nice, actually. Very runnable trails, but undulating. Um, not a PB course, but on a sunny day, it's a pretty lovely place. It's another body of water. We like water. <laughs> we love the water. I love a marathon that's not a PB course and maybe is trail, but not super hard. It's undulating. If we want to have a really decent run. Yeah. Time is irrelevant, but you get a really decent long Sunday run. Oh, my favorite one. It's one down here, Gary. You never heard of it. It's called the Stenning Stinger. And uh, it's really hilly. It's a marathon. I think it's a marathon. Not Maybe not even quite a marathon. It's got about, for us English listeners, about 4,000 feet of climbing, I think. Muddy. But at the end, you get the, you, it's a starts and finishes in a school. And at the end, you get a mug. Classic. Classic, love a mug. And then you get the kids from the school are all um, volunteering and they have little menu cards and, oh. they, and they're like, what would you like for your fried breakfast? Oh my goodness. <laughs> and you get like eggs, bacon or mushrooms, tomatoes and then you have a cup of tea in your mug. And I mean, 
Uh, I love the sound of that. Well, I still, I've done all these big races that are still up there. Yeah. It sounds oh, out real quick, though. Is no one's surprised. One? <laughs> Just, right, London coming up. That's how you feeling? Well, I'm a bit, not a mess. I'm just... <laughs> Uh, I'm, <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm just not into it. Full, full stop. I'm, you know, I've even thought about not going. Um, but I am going to go. I think I'll be like chucking my toys out the pram if mm. I don't go. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to go. I'm just the whole thing frustrates me. I'm pretty sure there's, there is some kind of expo retail well, I experience. Saw somebody who I won't mention is speaking at the expo. And I thought, yeah. what? This is good. I'm, I'm sorry, Gary, but I'm so happy I'm not. I've not made the effort to pay for flights and tests and yeah. accommodation to come over because I'm just silently raging a little bit about that. That it's all. It just seems a money making. I understand that they need the sponsors. I know yeah. we've got to get over it as well, and that people are going to go and do it, and they want to run the London Marathon. But it seems a little bit. I think I've said it before, if it is to reduce, you know, this whole baggage thing to reduce touch points, then why this export? I really, I just can't get my head around it at all. And luckily for me, I'm not chasing the time. If it's three hours, four hours, well, five hours, I miss my train home, so I don't want to be five hours. <laughs> but if it, that, that's not the point. But still, I've got to it sounds a really trivial see, when I'm saying it, I'm kind of embarrassing, but you've got to carry your phone and stuff like that. And for some people... That that's just not a possibility. So, uh, you know, am I going to have a COVID test as I go into the uh, like the pen? I, don't, I really don't know. I think I've heard about you've like got random. You've, still got a, you've still got to have a COVID test, haven't you? A couple. Of yeah, days. I got to have a COVID test during the week. But I've heard that at some point you may just be like spot check to yeah. prove that you're you're um, uh, negative. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, I just, you know, and you look at I see Berlin this weekend. Um, I see pictures of friends running, and then all bottle bags and stuff like that they've been told to purchase and uh, yeah i think london have done it and, and berlin and expo too i've seen pictures of people at expo and a, a lot less people at the expo than when i was there my goodness me it was horrendous um anyway that's all getting too negative you've got you've got something on this weekend too haven't you oh it's not important um i just wanted to while we're talking about london too is there's been a few people on our facebook group saying that they're doing it so good luck to anybody yes. Good look, everyone. Who is running and who's never experienced London Marathon? My first experience of London Marathon, I ran it when I was 18 with my mum, which was really a new back then. This is hundreds of years ago. And my dad worked for Age Concern and he got these two marathon places and my mum had never run. She was she was my first coaching client when I was 18. Oh, wow. Uh, and I was a runner, you know, I was running cross but I was running 800 metres. So we tra I trained her up and we used to go out every Sunday. And so dad used to come out in the car, in the old Mondeo, with some squash and digestive biscuits. And uh, I remember us like building up these Sunday runs. And mum used to make us a pudding for after, like a pineapple upside down pudding, because she'd be like, we need all this. Oh, yeah. So, happy so I did that. Oh, that was a long time ago, but I loved it. I loved it. And um, so hopefully... All the other tech, once it starts, once it starts, it starts, it will be a hugely enjoyable experience for anyone that's never experienced it. First marathon, second, whatever, um, just to go out and enjoy it. How's this week looking? What what are you doing for training wise? Because you're saying it's like you're not worried about the time. So, well, yeah, it will be a slightly modified week. Um, I think I've got five times one K tonight, and then you know, I'd probably still doing some miles. I think by the end of the week, I'll probably still have kind of. 70 miles um of running 60 odd 70 miles um but maybe just some easy runs or strides after this six five times a k and uh, there won't be anything on saturday come on then i'll go back to london again you you're settled about you. you've got your big race <laughs> yes yeah so this week i've just yeah i've got to do it set my bike a little bit later spin the legs and i'll do a couple of i will um I've got massage later um, and I will do a couple of runs because otherwise I'll feel like a slug um, and I'm just getting all the, I'm, so I sort of my race admin, I decided I did that first, which in previous podcasts, as we all know where it's all gone, <laughs> right, it's planned. I've done the other life admin first. So I've done race admin now, that's all sorted. And now I just need to sort kids admin and I'm trying to, I've got some great friends who are athletes as well. And they're having yeah. kids, they're just like, just give us kids, Eddie. 
Brilliant. The kids, we will sort the kids because they've got all these activities. Don't worry about it. So that's a huge load of my mind. And I'm, this week I'm being like, right, I'm going to be in bed by nine, which is tricky because the kids go to bed at like 8.40. <laughs> so last night my husband came home at like <laughs> quarter to eight from work and I was like, okay, well, this has been on it. <laughs> See and now I'm going to bed. See ya. But I'm just going to be really strict about it and just try and bank that bit of extra sleep because I never sleep yeah. well the night before a race. And then I get anxious that I'm not sleeping well. So I'm going to try. Yeah. And I'm missing a really good friend's birthday party tonight and everybody's, all my mates are going. Oh, that's dedication. Know, that is quite dedication. I'm not sure if that's too over-dedicated. But I kind of think, you know, I've done all this training. We do all this training. We put all this monetary, you know, investment yes. into races and... Yeah, people having my kids, people having my dogs. There's a lot of other people involved as well. My That's husband, a good point, like, actually. I can't, I can't. Then like, um, if I go out tonight, it's kind of like, well, it's going to be be late, be like to midnight, be on my feet, you know, yeah. miss a meal around a lot of people that could potentially have viruses or something. I kind yeah. of think, you know, there's the narrowing of the tunnel. <laughs> Talking about the tunnel. The <laughs> narrowing of the focus yeah. is really important. Whatever, if it's... it. It doesn't have you don't have to be an elite athlete, but that's sort of like putting yourself on the start line mentally in the best yeah. kind of preparation, having prepared and all these little things like missing a party and going to bed early and thinking about planning the meals and stuff. I to me it makes me like mentally a little bit more tougher because I'm yeah. kind of narrowing my focus. And by like Thursday and Friday, I'll be and try and be like all I'll be like is like quiet and just thinking about the race and conserving yeah. energy. And this is all from lessons learned when I haven't. Uh, and I've been like on the Friday before a 50 miler out with the kids doing stuff all day and then coming back and throwing some gels in a backpack. And, and you can still do it, but it's just harder work, I think. I think it's a good point. When other people are investing in you too, like people looking after the kids and Bryn, and then for you to be out. <laughs> and if it doesn't go well, then it's, yeah, I, I get so it. Eddie has no self-control, yeah. so I'd go out, hear with music, <laughs> tapping. I love all that, but I'm kind of like, there's a time and a place, and yeah, um, yeah and, I, and I want to do my training justice, and I kind of think, God, I haven't done all those hard sessions and all that grind yeah. and all that seven o'clock on the turbos and... 6am you know i haven't done all that to then the week of the race when it's the time when you need to kind of rein that all in and focused not so let's it feels see. like it's coming on fast i know and then oh, so i'm kind of like i don't know if you do this as rate when there's races life doesn't carry on after the race i kind of like all i'm doing is focusing on it. and then i've got to like recover from this race and then there's the hundred and 70k not far on there i'm like oh lord i'm not gonna think about that because i no, 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 no. That's if i think about that i'll be like oh no, oh no 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 i can't do that so one race at a time so yeah, yeah pray for me on saturday i'll pray for you <laughs> london marathons on sunday though so i'll be home tea i'll be watching for you on tv the middle-aged white guy with the gopro i'll spot you easily won't i uh, there's probably one of the twenty thousand of us <laughs> um yeah i don't think i'm gonna do the gopro i'm, I'm not very comfortable uh, when i'm filming in public i feel a bit kind of self-conscious so i'm not too sure if i'm gonna do it uh just think i'll be well, you have your phone with you you can just get some lovely yeah. instagram yeah. <laughs> We're hitting miss on the GoPro, but yeah, best of luck, Eddie. I'm, uh, luck hope it all you. goes well. <laughs> if not, as we always say, great content. Great. Oh yeah, there's going to be some chat, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody, I've got my Vaseline all ready. All this right. is stuff. This is amazing. This stuff they give us when the kids are, or have stitches, and then they like put it on to keep it. And it's amazing uh, anti-chaffing stuff. I've never chaffed or chafed stop it no leather never. thighs never ever anywhere I don't remember. I've, I've, you must have, have skin as thick as a rhinoceros <laughs> baby's bum my skin um no i was a bit soft like, your back, like where your backpack is and stuff no i don't remember any any um i remember so bum after the bog going round <laughs> but that was about it <laughs> oh my god i literally after this race i will lit when i don't envisage this but when i take my clothes off i will have chaffing marks of where everything was you know, the vest the under underarm vest, the backpack even yeah. where the shorts sit on my waist it will yeah. all be chaffed oh my goodness it must be, it must be my I've never, i don't remember having the bleedy nipples oh no no don't that. that's gone too far <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> right, let's talk about our competition. Yes. Uh, mixed bag. We've had a larity. Gary's <sighs> made me play these songs on Spotify. He's gone, play this one. You'll hate this one, Eddie. You'll hate this one. There's only one I liked and you probably heard it. <laughs> we've each chosen uh our winner and i will put this together on a spotify playlist and i will um maybe we'll keep it open and people can add in once it goes once it goes live i will put it out and i expect people will add in so i think you can probably add in and take away songs that you don't like you can um you can you have to have run of the hills though that's got to go in there surely um i am made in classic that's it. we couldn't have that as the winner though it was just too uh it was too, so i chose my winner was emma roper passenger 27 by the whispers and i was just oh god love it it has got swearing in so maybe yeah. not on the uh football the runs uh but uh i really enjoyed it and then i listened to the whispers album which i then also really enjoyed too so thanks emma for well, being a bit of knowledge a bit of, love a bit of musical uh musical sharing and what about you go on yeah, say, yeah. It. You- say it say it well, yeah. Did I say it wrong? You never said, I've said if I said it right or wrong. With Hilly, Hilary Sved, Pantera, the song is Walk. And uh, yeah, my goodness, I used to love Pantera. It got some great... It's just people hitting a drum. Rash. Oh, it's so ignorant for you to say that. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty heavy metal. I suppose it's a fair reflection. Yeah, that was a right blast from the there's past. A, there's a t- we were talking though, isn't there? There's a time for heavy metal. We were talking about when you might listen to it in a hundred mile. I was like... I- 24 hours a day, heavy metal, John. Well, just go from the start. Wash the dishes, heavy metal. Take the dog out, heavy metal. Do the tea, heavy metal. <laughs> Your lucky family. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And I'll get that playlist. I won't lie, it won't be this week. Uh, <laughs> next week, when I'm sitting in all my, uh, with my legs up and my cankles, I will put that together on Spotify and I'll see if I can share it, how I share it. This is all, it'll be hilarious. Um, <laughs> But I'll put that all together next week. Thank you for everybody that entered the competition. And Emma Emma and Hilary, get in touch. And we will send you a box of Cheer Charge Flapjacks. That was episode 57. Thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. I always have a blast, Eddie. It's my favourite Tuesday morning Zoom call of the week, this is. (laughs) (laughs) You're my favourite Tuesday morning Zoom call too, Gary. (laughs) My name's Gary Thwaites. I'm Eddie Sutton. And let's run to the hills.